dear colleagues, nice to be with you somehow. Today's uh, subject, the threat of self-censorship in uh, publishing calls for a discussion of a fundamental question. Are we as publishers still capable, as expressed in the IPA charter, of promoting and defending freedom to publish, of respecting the principle of copyright, and promoting and defending literacy and reading? Or are we increasingly confronted by the power of extremes where the demands of pragmatism challenge our basic ideals? This happens when profit becomes the unique aim of the publishing venture existing on a purely commercial basis, or when we publishers function as obedient underlings for a political regime of, of powerful multinational owners. In these cases, self-censorship and the chilling effect are inevitable and our business itself becomes a threat to our ideals. If, on the other hand, we as publishers wish to defend democratic values based on human rights and to stand as defenders of true freedom of expression, self-censorship represents a major threat to our profession if it's allowed to flourish. What do we mean by self-censorship? To put it uh, simply, self-censorship occurs when we censor ourselves or our profession in order to avoid conflict or unfair or personal consequences. Is this really a problem in the publishing world of today? I'm sorry to, to say absolutely. I think all of us in this room may cause self-censorship in our respective publishing houses, and more so than our editorial departments. That is why it is a fundamental task for this Congress to strengthen our awareness of this phenomenon, and increased understanding of what is at stake can, will make it possible to work against self-censorship, to banish it and turn it into a taboo for every publishing house subscribing to the fundamental rights of publishing. How does uh, self-censorship arise? The fields uh, of conflict are manifold. Religious and cultural diversity sharpen latent differences, coefficients. Superficial political correctness may uh, make us too cautious. Economic risk confronts us why, with the dilemmas and changes caused by new structures of leadership in publishing houses strengthen the threat of self censorship. It is not just fear of the pressure from outside, a Rushdie Fatwa or a Charlie Hebdo, that can function as triggers. The way we work as publishers is just as important. In other words, the threat of self-censorship in publishing manifests itself on two levels. Internally, treated by ownership politics, the values held by leaders and working methods. Externally, triggered by fear or pressure caused by religious 
political or cultural elements. In the following, uh, I shall focus mainly on the first of these two elements. How today's owners, boards and management confront these challenges. What changes in publishing structures and recruitment increase the danger of self-censorship? Are we in the situation where self-censorship has become, become the elephant in the room of today's publishing structures, the taboo that we never mentioned? For instance, how many in this uh, present audience are involved in the current process of evaluating manuscripts? How many of you uh, meet with the writers regularly? How many exercise a direct editorial responsibility? Of course, uh, several of you still do. All the same, I maintain that we have seen considerable change in the professional background of the delegates of the IPA of the last 30 years, mirroring changes in leadership and responsibilities. In this uh, period, publishing houses have grown as a result of national and international mergers. Leadership based on the so-called publisher model, where the head of the company is responsible not only for the bottom line, but also for editorial strategy, has been abandoned to a large extent. The global liberalist wave of the late, uh, late 80s caused an intensified focus on size. The chase for quick profit pushed more long-term literary goals aside. A culture of greed developed that also hit the media and the world of publishing. The first big mergers came already in the 70s, strongly motivated by the possibilities of new media technology. And the new me multimedia groups were promised a golden future. After this period of more or less successful mergers, one essential question remains. What happened to the independence of editorial decisions and strategies? A sacred principle that is based on absolute non-intervention in editorial matters from board and owners. As publishers with a more traditional literary background were replaced by leaders with experience from finance, the distance between the distance, I underline the distance between editors and top management increased. Pressure for increased profitability led to more power for economic considerations and more pressure from marketing departments, weakening the influence of professional editorial experience. Short-term thinking replaced the will and courage to make room for an editorial policy with long-term prospects. Mentalities changed, opening up for self-censorship and overly cautious editorial approach based on secure, more commercial thinking. The work on an active backlist was significantly reduced. New methods also lead to an yeah, increasing, I would say, homogeneity in the lists of publishers that used to make their mark in publishing because of their 
innovative and the diverse literary fiction and non-fiction, but no where it used to mere imprints. The search for new literary fiction suffered, particularly in the American and British markets, making it very hard for colleagues from the rest of the world to find new significant literary voices to introduce to their own reading public. The appearance of small publishing houses had to a certain extent remedied this situation, but far too often they are swallowed up by the big corporations with depressing consequences. The new structures also affected the right situation. Publishing uh, houses concerned uh, because of the developing of right sales, particularly in the Anglo-Saxon countries, realized that they had to explore and secure new avenues for maintaining their own rights and those of the writers. The writers and their organizations demanded it, and the pressure caused by an increasing number of big competitors made it necessary. In my country, in Norway, the publishers and writers organization negotiated a groundbreaking standard agreement in 1990 together. This agreement secured a standard royalty scale of the authors, a scale for royalty. But a crucial element in our context was the establishment of the right of the publisher not only to the primary publishing rights, but also to the sub-rights and foreign rights, implying, of course, a follow-up duty. This uh, was considered a victory for the role of classic publishing in an approach of drastic changes, we can say in modern times. One sector that has thrived in the wake of the obvious vacuum created by the standardization of corporate publishing is that of the literary agent. The literary agent of today has taken on of the essential task, has taken on many of the essential tasks that fell by the wayside as publishers moved on towards global mergers. The agents come up with ideas, they recruit writers, are dedicated readers of manuscripts and demand that rights, both for backlist and new titles, are taken care of in the author's best, the author's best interest on the literary and professional as a, well on an economic level. But on the other hand, the activity has meant increased economic pressure on publishing houses, which have to spend heavily on buying rights instead of handling and develop, developing them themselves. It has also affected the author's profits. How do today's editors feel about their role? What happened to hands-on publishing carried out by dedicated publishers and editors anchored in a firm belief in the importance of long-term strategy, taking care of the authors 
and enabling them to flourish, building a strong national literary tradition, and also in due course, bringing about financial success. What many publishers have refused to acknowledge in the 30 years or so that are now behind us is the fact that for the publishers, the ideal purpose of taking on our share of responsibility for the developing of our respective societies and guaranteeing freedom of expression is the very key to profit if measured properly. This remains a paradox in today's liberalist publishing industry. Luckily, there are brilliant examples of the opposite in today's world, where publishing groups are running complete accordance with our ideal purpose on all levels. And uh, the paradox is that this long-term focus on quality based on a confident interaction with the writers and society will guarantee profit in the long run. Self-censorship as an undermining threat to honest quality publishing is kept at bay. And the publisher's role as guardian of freedom of expression is secured, also according to our charter. As stated in my opening remarks, self-censorship is based on fear and leads to the chilling effect. Fear, perhaps, of economic risks, fear of reprisal, such as the threat of losing your job or being demoted or being passed over for promotion. Self-censorship may be triggered by fear of standing out of leaving the safety of group consensus, of not being politically correct. This is uh, definitely a dilemma in the Nordic affluent societies. Fear may be triggered by rules of law concerning defamation or blasphemy. Uh, the law against uh, this has abolished in a way, by the way. Or by hate and racism. Despite all this, what keeps a publisher going is firm belief that the ideal on and the creative dimension of publishing outweighs personal risks. But fear may also spring from the other threats in authoritarian regimes. The pressure of political power and public uh, persecution of a publisher remains a frightening dimension. It is not a representative factor in our discourse uh, today because it's a very extraordinary character and uh, surpasses our context. All the same, we are witness to extreme bravery from publishers who endure enormous pressure from the extremist regime in Turkey, for, ex for instance, and in many other countries where freedom of expression is perceived as a threat. As uh, president of Norwegian Pen, I have personally witnessed the pressure that Turkish publishers and journalists uh, have to stand up to. In such countries, the situation is so extreme that many earlier warnings in this speech about forms of leadership do not apply. The struggle is personal and existential to a degree that goes far be beyond the working terms we know for, from uh, democracies. This is the case for every regime on the list of nations with suppressed freedom of the, of the press and freedom of expression. 
we all know the World Press Freedom Index, where, uh, for instance, Turkey, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and China are all near the bottom in this ranking list covering 180 countries. What uh, we wish for are publishers who remain steady, come hell or high water, committed to the protection of the entire literary landscape, non-fiction, trillions books, and educational literature, and standing up for a truly controversial versatility. What we wish for, in spite of marketing-based commercialism and global publishing groups, are publishing houses that truly understand the essence of editorial obligation in our day and age, that commit to it with the deepest respect for human dignity and that are able to create a solid framework of respect for freedom of expression and the fight against self-censorship. At the end of the day, it all comes down to leadership and purpose uh, in all kinds of publishing houses, both big and small. It is possible to keep self-censorship in check and turn fear into courage and commitment to quality. Thank you.